So tonight we're talking about ecology and nature. Obviously it's a key part of how we experience Vancouver, whether it's the forests of Stanley Park. I got to spend today um, showing our, one of our guests around who hasn't been to Vancouver before, been, been to Vancouver very recently. Some of the, the, you know, the, the shoreline of False Creek, um, Still Creek in East Vancouver where chum salmon spawn. We did a tour around Stanley Park and looked at some of the kelp beds offshore and some of the very old forests that make up Stanley Park. So we are custodians of a, of a broad range of very important natural areas. Um, that provide a broad range of services. Melina Schofield will talk about some of the ecosystem services around green infrastructure that they provide. And a real question, what does, our, what does the ecology of our city look like now and what will it look like in the future? So I think this is a, a very, again, a topic that's very close to the hearts of many Vancouverites. Tonight we are um, honored to have Stiebel, Stephen um, Applebaum and Melina Schofield to explore innovation in the integration of urban and ecological systems. Um, the structure of the evening will be to have uh, Melina speak first for 20 minutes, followed by Steve for 40 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer period that's approximately 30 to 40 minutes after. And then we'll have an opportunity where people can still join us after that for a conversation at the Hotel Georgia. So our first speaker is Melina Schofield, who's a professional engineer with a long-standing dedication to sustainability and innovation in the municipal sector. Melina is currently the manager of Green Infrastructure Implementation, which is a department or a branch within engineering um, within the city of Vancouver, and is responsible for this, implementing the city's ambitious rain city strategy, which developed from the integrated rainwater management plan. Prior to taking on this new role, Melina was engaged in the private sector in the field of green buildings, both as a construction management consultant and built green certified residential builder with a special interest in passive house design and construction methods. Previously, Molina worked ne nearly 11 years within the city of Vancouver as the first manager of the city's sustainability group. Um, and Molina's portfolio included advancing the greenest city goals as well as climate protection, renewable energy, climate change adaptation, and green building programs, as well as working on the sustainability operations for the 2010 Olympics. So please join me in welcoming Melina Schofield. Hi everyone, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here tonight and really appreciate the invitation from Urbanarium. So here we are, the rain city strategy. We've had a great example of that in the past couple of days with our intense rainfalls. So you're gonna see a lot of pictures in this. Summer of Vancouver, because we've got some wonderful examples of, of projects over the past 20 years and others from locations that we take inspiration from in other jurisdictions. So I know for this crowd, being a local crowd, I don't need to say that you all know that Vancouver is a city surrounded by water. It's a huge part of our identity. It's a huge part of our daily experience. It's a huge part of our culture. Rain, in fact, is a huge part of our culture. However, what we know is that our natural watersheds have changed dramatically. And this picture is a great um, representation. This is 1893, False Creek. In fact, the watersheds in this picture have actually changed dramatically because it used to be forest before that. Well, here's exactly the same outlook today. Exactly the same outlook. Look at that. So we've done a lot to build our city to grow and to prosper and to be a thriving metropolitan center, not only within British Columbia, but in the world now. And yet we know that there's a lot of work to do to help us to continue to be a thriving city in the future. This past summer was a great opportunity to look for headlines. You didn't have to go very far to look at big issues that are happening all over the world, all across North America, and even in Vancouver, about how our climate is changing and what we need to start to prepare for as we look forward to 2050. So 2050, that's what we're thinking ahead with the Rain City Strategy. We're trying to think about how do we use rainwater in the future? How does rainwater play a role in shaping and serving our community? And there's a lot of work to do. This is a fabulous picture of our beautiful Kitsilano pool. Who would like to go swimming and just go straight on out to the ocean? No need for borders here, you can go right on out. This is just a small snapshot of a King Tide event back in 2012 that's really looking at what it's gonna mean for us in the future. I love the, the little um, factoid at the top that someone from our graphics department put up there. You can see what we're expecting with our climate change projections. We're expecting warmer winters and a 58% decline in snowpack. 
The thing I'd like to clarify here though is that what we don't need to worry about is whether or not we can ski in 2050. What we need to worry about is actually our drinking water sheds. That 58% decline in snowpack is actually in the mountains that serve all of our drinking waters that Metro Vancouver enjoys, Coquitlam, Capilano, Seymour. These are our vital resources and for the future with declining snowpack that means less recharge during those dry periods. Okay, so some of the other things we're expecting in 2050, sea level rise, I know a lot of folks in this group probably are familiar. And I just love this picture because this was actually a public art project that was done before the Olympics. And those blue lines on the footings of the Canby Street Bridge were based on some of the original intergovernmental panel on climate change projections for sea level rise. And for a lot of people, it's really hard to conceptualize what sea level rise is gonna mean to us in our urban fabric. This is a great way to start the conversation, get people thinking about, well, wow, what does that look like in my city? And how do we need to start preparing for that? Of course, other projections, much more intense rainstorms. We are gonna see a lot more intense rainstorms like we experienced in this past week. I don't know if anybody here is up around the Broadway Canby area, but it looked like we were on the seawall with waves from the ocean. They were literally going into the shop fronts. It was this huge, intense storm event. It did not last very long, but boy, was there an impact. And so you really start to see that if that's only happening right now, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year, maybe once every couple of years, what's that gonna look like in the future when that's happening multiple times a year, multiple times a season? How do we start to prepare and change our urban form to manage that in the future? This one I love because I bet if I asked most people in this room, most people would say, oh, we're a very temperate climate. We don't get too hot, we don't get too cold. Very few people think about urban heat and urban heat issues here in Vancouver. But I can tell you, it is a very real issue. Back in 2009, there was a prolonged heat event in Vancouver, a heat wave, and there was over 122 people in Metro Vancouver who passed away just from that one event. 122 people, over a one week period. What would we do if that was coming from people's railings falling off of their buildings? Or if that was coming from traffic collisions or some other type of, of public planning situation? It is very significant and I really wanna highlight this one because our city is changing and we're seeing it already. This past summer we had very high um, heat and we had a lot of drought periods. It was actually similar to the 2015 drought that many people are, are familiar with, but we had such great snowpack that it wasn't in the public consciousness. So people didn't realize that our trees were suffering and they were losing their leaves and that there was a lot of our natural systems that were under stress. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our vision for the Rain City strategy and what we're hoping to accomplish. Um, Nick was asking me before, like, what's your main point you want to make? And I, I think for me, what I'm really hoping for is that we strive for culture change and how we think about rainwater in our city. You can see our, our lovely vision here that we're going to be bringing to council shortly. And that is that Vancouver's rainwater is valued as a resource for our communities and our natural systems. So how do we start thinking differently about rain, not as a nuisance product, not as a waste product to be quickly whisked, whisked away as fast as possible through a pipe network down to our low-lying areas, but how do we think of it actually as an integral part of our system? And of course, there are many different ways to do that. We could do it with conventional engineering approaches, or we could take a more green infrastructure based approach that's looking at our natural systems and how we start to mimic natural processes around the water cycle in our city. So we've got three main goals. The first is water quality. The second is resilience and I touched a bit on some of the resilience as it relates to climate change planning and adaptation. But thirdly is around enhancing our livability through our natural and urban ecosystems. So the water quality piece I like to try to break down because as I've been talking to a lot of people about the Rain City strategy in Vancouver, it's become clear that not everybody's entirely clear about what our water quality issues are. So it's really twofold. One, we have a combined sewer system. So about half of our city pipes are a combination of roof rainwater runoff as well as sewage from a property that go into the same pipe and get transported off to our wastewater treatment plant. When it rains heavily, sometimes the capacity of those pipes gets exceeded and there has to be an exit, a release for that diluted sewage water. It's called a combined sewer overflow. So we have combined sewer overflows happening all around the city at the moment. It's primarily an issue during the winter time when we have intense rain events, but nevertheless, it's a significant issue for Vancouver and many other cities. 
So we have a, a regulatory obligation to have no combined sewer overflows by 2050. We're now looking to how green infrastructure can play a role in helping us meet that goal. Secondly, even if we had no combined sewer overflows, we do have an issue with contaminants. Stormwater picks up all kinds of contaminants, whether it's from roofs or recently, as I learned, from some of that nice galvanized sheet metal <laughs> that people like to use for design effect these days. It's also picking up zinc and other types of contaminants. Just some examples of in the public right-of-way I think would be obvious to many people about hydrocarbons that's picked up, but what about zinc? How many people knew that zinc is in tires and every time your tires wear down that you're actually contributing zinc to the road? How about every time you break your vehicle? You're actually contributing copper pollution into that atmosphere and it's getting picked up in our rainwater into the catch basin and it's straight out unfiltered into our receiving waters affecting those aquatic habitats. So to date for Vancouver, we've been largely focused on a grey infrastructure approach. We view grey infrastructure as necessary but costly and of course it's not that adaptable. You put a pipe in the ground and you hope it's going to be there for 80 to 100 years and of course very limited opportunity to integrate with other objectives. So now what we're trying to do is challenge ourselves to think differently and how do we integrate natural systems and green infrastructure approaches into the future of our water and rainwater management. We know it's cost effective from other jurisdictions. We know it's very adaptable because it tends to be at the surface. So if it's not meeting our needs or if conditions change, we can adapt it more easily than having to dig up all the roads and put in very, very costly new pipe systems. It's also a tremendous opportunity to leverage co-benefits. One dollar invested in green infrastructure will bring benefits to many other city objectives that can be challenging to do with a pipe only type solution. So as I mentioned, it's cost effective. And this is something that we've been having to really question ourselves on. And it's funny, recently one of our business planning folks said, boy, I've been looking at it in other cities. And they are doing it because there is a very strong economic rationale to do it. So they're not doing it because it's the right thing. They're not doing it because it's the progressive thing, because it's the environmentally sound way of doing it. They're doing it because it is economic to deliver management of rainwater through green infrastructure systems versus uh, purely gray infrastructure. So just to touch on our approach, a lot of folks in this audience I think might be familiar with some of our different city initiatives, but what became clear very on to the team at City of Vancouver is that green infrastructure intersects with a wide range of corporate programs and, and benefits. So really it's about rainwater managing rainwater, but also it's about rainwater becoming the vehicle to deliver on a huge range of city priorities. What also became clear, which is both a challenge and, a, and an opportunity, is this is a complex task. This is not the task of just the engineering department. This is not the task of just the parks department or just the planning department. This requires people, no matter what their capacity within our organization, to take their talents and their thinking and their energy and ideas to help us explore a new way of doing business. And it covers across a great wide range of city departments. And so that alone of coordinating and bringing alignment to people is a, is a significant part of what we're trying to do. So for many people, when we've talked about green infrastructure, they're not sure quite what that looks like. This group may have more familiarity, but I'd just like to provide some snapshots of some things that we know are tools that are available and some things that we take inspiration from. So there's a lot of the typical things like tree well structures that we use down in the Olympic Village, green roof systems. We have many. For 30 years, we've been doing green roofs in Vancouver. Is it the mainstay? Not yet, but it is a prominent practice, even things like porous asphalt and looking at other types of um, hard surface pavements that infiltrate. Of course, Vancouver, as you know, has a big interest in uh, transportation and looking at light rail opportunities, among other, whether it's for Arbutus Corridor or around the uh, perimeter of False Creek. Here's a beautiful example of actually an engineered green system that provides a foundation rather than a hardscape that just heats up and doesn't provide all those other benefits. Bioswales, absorbent landscaping, the power of soil, the power of the quality of soil, the ecosystems, the depth of soil, these are very simple things that we can do to make a large difference. Constructed wetlands like we've got in the Olympic Village. I know our Parks Board's got a number of delighting streams that they've been exploring, uh, which we're happy to, to work with them on. And of course, detention tanks. How do we hold that water? <laughs> So I just wanted to highlight, I mentioned that this is really a big team effort and our team, again, we're trying to take a very diversified approach. We've got engineers, landscape architects, planners, and urban ecologists, technicians, finance people, 
communications people all coming together to try to figure out a new way of doing business. And one of the big areas that I feel like is often a gap for us in the municipal sector is having adequate understanding of ecology and the important role of ecology in the city. So we're thinking now just about our soil ecosystems. How do we support those soil ecosystems to have the bacteria, the fungi, and the whole food chain, food web, that is going to help create the performance we need to manage those contaminant issues and to manage stormwater in the way that we want. I know our urban ecologists um, gave this beautiful slide, which I think really represents that sometimes when we go out and plant, we plant discrete little pots. Well, how about this idea of layering and actually bring all different layers and structure to the city that enhances biodiversity, but also the performance from a stormwater management perspective? And of, co of course, looking at the role of plants in remediation. I was just having a little chat with Nick about trying to better understand what are some of the contaminants that we're targeting in different areas of the city so that we can design plant-based and soil-based systems in those areas to target specific contaminants of interest. And again, there's a lot of science behind that that takes a real team effort. It's not the conventional skill set of a drainage or stormwater engineer or even of many landscape architects. It really takes, again, that interdisciplinary approach. This is a wonderful um, example here of a phytoremediation project. They call it the Sponge Park Project. We love it because it's looking at how do you manage rainwater and stormwater and your contaminant water quality issue in a way that creates an amazing, inspiring and attractive public space. So again, bringing in the urban design elements about how we enjoy and live in our city. This is a nice uh, a snapshot from the Cloudburst program in Denmark. Look at this, designed to flood. Right? Do we always have to have the big walls up or do we need to allow ourselves to live with water and let water play a, um, a shaping role in our city? This is a lovely example. We, we love looking to Rotterdam for all of the work that they've done around this. You can see by day, there's a basketball court and some public realm plazas. I know this is a drawing, but we actually have seen real picture with real people and I can tell you that a lot of people like to hang out in this public space. Oh, it rains. It's a chance to just capture that rain. Combined sewer overflows are particularly affected by the intensity and volume of rainfall entering that pipe. If we can find a way to collectively hold back some of that volume and have it disperse more slowly, we can actually address some of those combined sewer overflow issues. This is a picture of uh, city of Chicago. Okay, nice big parking lot in the big, beautiful, built-up city. Wow, look at that, green roofs. Incredible program, 5.5 million square feet of green roofs. And I'm pretty sure that people aren't thinking about how this is helping with the cooling of my city or how it's helping me manage my rainwater. They're thinking what a great public space this is. This is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation down in Seattle. We really love this example because it was a concept for fully integrated rainwater management throughout the system that at the time actually wasn't allowed in, under any of their bylaws. And so where are our opportunities to challenge ourselves to think differently? Where are we the barriers? What do we need to change? What kind of policy um, and practices do we need to have in place to allow innovators and early adopters to help us shape the work as we move forward? So I mentioned that we're creating an implementation plan and we're looking forward to 2050. We're really trying to be more strategic. There's 38,000 catch basins in the city. In the public realm alone, if we had to go and do a little mini treatment system at each one, that is billions of dollars worth of infrastructure. We're trying to be more strategic and think about our priorities and how do we implement the city and how do we leverage our opportunities and where, to what extent, and what are all the mechanisms by which we can do that. So I'm just going to take you just very briefly through some of the mapping work we've been doing to try to answer some of those questions. So from a water quality standpoint, many people who've been around Vancouver realize we don't have a lot of natural streams anymore. You know, the ones in blue are the few remaining, and I think there's only a couple there that are actually salmon bearing, Still Creek and down a Musqueam. So a lot of those streams are buried underground now. They're, they're quite low, below, some of them are going around buildings and other structures or they're in culverts. And these red lines here represent our drainage sheds and you can see that they largely match those former streams. So they follow nature's lines of how water flows. But then we started to look, okay, so we know those are our drainage sheds. Well, where are we having the worst combined sewer overflow problems? Maybe we really need to prioritize our efforts to re reduce that impact on receiving waters. 
So the darker pink colors are showing where we're having some of our more challenging uh, combined sewer overflow problems. And we can look to where is that water going? It's going to some of our precious public spaces and beaches. I mean, on the positive side, most people aren't swimming in the middle of November when we're having some of our worst challenges with overflowing systems. Nevertheless, it's an issue that we need to attend to. And I know that many in Vancouver care a lot about False Creek as a public space. Then we start to look at, well, where's development happening? It's both an opportunity and a challenge. We know that we're densifying as a city, and that means less land that can actually infiltrate water in a natural way. So as we're densifying, as we're building larger floor plate buildings, what are we going to do differently to manage the rainwater? So it's both a challenge and an opportunity. We're going to have more sewage waste. We're going to potentially have more stormwater runoff unless we take some alternate steps, some bold new steps to look at how we do business differently. From a resilience standpoint, I mentioned urban heat. It's a huge issue and it's here today. Look at this, 42 to 49 degrees. This is actually the surface temperature. This one was quite striking for our team when we started to put the dots together and we started to think about sea level rise. It's a big community conversation happening now in Vancouver. And we started to think about our system that basically is designed to capture rainwater from all over a mountain, to put it in pipes and to send it at high speed through gravity down to our low-lying vulnerable areas, the areas in blue there that we, think we know are prone to flooding for the future. So how do we get stormwater out of those pipes infiltrating where it lands so that we're not placing increasing vulnerability on those areas that are already subject to flooding and pressure from sea level rise. We're also thinking about water availability in the city. We know that there's a gap in the future regional water supply that Metro Vancouver is projecting by the mid-2030s that regional supply is no longer going to meet regional demand. And that's going to take some big decisions and big dis um, changes in how we manage our water resources. What would we do differently today with rainwater as a resource, harvesting and reusing to meet our, our city needs? We've talked with the Parks Board folks about how do we help meet water needs in the short term, potentially for some irrigation needs using non-potable water that in the emergency situation like an earthquake or a disrupted regional supply could actually provide some life-saving benefits. From a livability and, and uh, ecosystems perspective, you see this map, nope, it's not a trick. It's not the exact mirror of the urban heat. It's our tree canopy map. Wow, there's a huge connection in the city between our urban heat challenges and how much greenscape and how much canopy we have in the city. There's a huge connection. They're virtually the same map in reverse. We're also thinking about our ecosystems and connectivity, and that's very challenging because we're so fragmented now with all of the development, but can we use green infrastructure investments, small adaptations, small measures, but widely distributed in the city to start to restore connectivity and connections and pathways within our, our city? From a strategic standpoint, for anybody here who's ever dug a construction hole, such as myself, you know that our, our land, our soil conditions are not great for infiltration, almost everywhere. Nevertheless, it can still handle some water. And so we're looking strategically, where do we have those very high infiltration potentials, or actually, sorry, I should say moderate. And it's those little brown pieces. And thankfully, actually, that's in the Canby Corridor where we're gonna see a lot of development. So there's possibility there for aquifer recharge. So I'll just leave it at that, but just to say that we invite everybody to be part of this because this is not something that the city can do on, a, on its own. This is something that's going to need private sector and community partners to help imagine new ways of handling rainwater, new ways of thinking about rainwater as a resource and planning ahead for the future for a really livable, resilient city and one of hopefully with much cleaner water as well. So thank you so much. I invite you to a walk and talk that we're going to have coming up at the Olympic Village. We're going to be talking about how that whole community was designed to be a sponge and how it manages rainwater in a more progressive way. So anyway, thank you very much and I look forward to hearing your questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Melina. Our second speaker is Steve Applebaum. Steve is an international scientific expert and one of the leading ecological consultants in the US. His work provides insight and design solutions at the intersection of ecological systems and developed and urban land uses. His, in recent years, he has worked closely with hydrologists to understand landscape scale hydrologic changes associated with land settlement in the Midwestern US with direct application to many hundreds of millions of acres in North America and elsewhere. 
His latest book is Restoring Ecological Health to Your Land, and his personal account of 30 years of restoring his Wisconsin farm in Nature's Second Chance have received a range of awards and rave reviews in the New York Times and other publications. Steve teaches at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and holds adjunct professorships and lectureships in, at several other universities. He was named a fellow of the Ecological Society of America this past February. Please welcome Steve. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. I've enjoyed uh, my day learning about your wonderful city today and learning about a few of the parks, getting some sense of their history, the design behind them, and had a wonderful day with wonderful people. So thank you, guys. So what I'd like to do is uh, dance lightly across the tip of the iceberg, icebergs and talk about a, a number of subjects this evening, uh, springboarding off of what Melina just presented, and really talk about how ecosystems have changed on the landscape that we see today, and how we might learn from the historic nature of ecosystems that were on the landscape, this landscape historically, and, and inform our future design from that historic performance of the ecosystems that were here historically. Uh, one of the most important things that we start with as scientists is we try to understand the ecological systems that were present and their historic functions. And the larger relationships at the watershed scale, the relationship of a watershed to a river, the relationship between the river and the coastal environment, all have really important understandings that we need to be aware of. The, the watershed is, I'm, I'm going to go quickly, it's the zone of carbonaceous material generation and the river is the zone of mobility and the zone where materials are broken down that are generated in the watershed. So trees that fall, insects that die, all sorts of life that's created on the larger landscape of the watershed is broken down both in the watershed and in the river and in the hydrologic systems that mobilize and are tributary to the river. The coastal environment is a zone of mixing, a zone of dilution. What's important to realize is that parks are haphazardly scattered across this landscape and don't honor those historic relationships and can't honor those historic relationships because of the nature uh, of the parks and the way they're laid out, and we'll talk more about that. It's also important to realize that every decision we make, whether you're making that decision at your church or in your own backyard, impacts potentially the nature of those historic relationships. Uh, whether you're creating impervious landscapes by, by paving over a street or a driveway or fertilizing your lawn or uh, watching climate change or contributing or not contributing to it, everything we do by default on a watershed scale or at a, at a watershed scale, especially cumulatively when all sorts of decisions are made, potentially materially impact that functionality of what's called the river continuum, the watershed to river to coastal continuum. Uh, the parks of today are fragmented, isolated ecosystem remnants and most have lost their historic semblance to the ecosystems of yesteryear their fragments are very challenging to manage. It's very, very expensive to manage a fragment of something. It's like taking the, the, the organ of a deer or a buffalo and trying to figure out how to manage that as though we're still part of a functioning deer. It's, it's impossible. In, in actuality, uh, a landscape is not that different, and we're learning about that. Uh, it's more expensive and the, the outcomes are less predictable when we fragment and uh, change the nature of the landscape. Isolation and edge effects impact the ecological system, the opportunity to manage it. And what we're learning is that there's increasing vulnerability from invasive species, hydrologic change, climate change, the whole stochastic events that we're experiencing from rainfall intensification to drought, all of that impacts these wonderful, beloved pieces of property that we call parks. Uh, ecological vulnerability is increasing at the same time that increased recreational demand on these parks is, is occurring. 
So there's this, there's this really interesting juxtaposition in time uh, and we need to be aware of that as we begin thinking about the next 50 years, the next 100 years for the city as a whole, the watersheds that it represents, the river continuums it represents, the coastal environments connected to, and our ambitions and aspirations as a community uh, that participate with this landscape. Uh, what does the park of the future look like? In my opinion, it has to cross all boundaries like water and air and wildlife. It can't be a piece of scraps of parcels that have remained from a haphazard, poorly coordinated development scenario. And I'm not chastising Vancouver. This has happened in every city around the world. We're left with the scraps. And we call them parks and we give them our love and our best ambitions and aspirations for a future. But they're, they really are uh, really disconnected in so many ways. Uh, envision a park system as a fabric of restored lands found throughout the landscape of a watershed. Don't view the park as the place with a park sign and a name. We, we have to expand the vision so that every, prob every pub public and private scrap of land, parcel of land, uh, whether it's loved now or, or not, has to be part of this system if we're going to see a park system that actually functionally provides for our own needs and ecological needs in the future. So it's a fabric of private and public lands. It's, 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 a, it's a coordination at different scales of time and space. Um, public, ex public expansions in restored public right-of-ways, uh, formal and informal landscapes that are brought into the process, restored landscapes where landowners in their own yard decide that they are interested in contributing to this larger picture, not, not doing something on their own property that might detract from the larger opportunity. Uh, I'll give you examples of these uh, ideas. What we're learning is that uh, where we create this cohesive and coordinated effort, we create communities of conservation. And I can tell you firsthand that the community and the people living in these places are completely different in the way they interact. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful place, and I'll give you a couple of examples. So my, my job this evening is to give you some examples where pieces of this puzzle are being put together, have been put together, they're functioning successfully, and also to give you some inkling of some of the other facets of these projects. I want you to understand, for example, that when we design ecologically, we typically save anywhere from five to 54% on the cost of the project. We've got probably 400 projects conventionally designed, ecologically designed, and then constructed ecologically, and the cost savings are outrageously uh, off the balance sheet of most of the developers that we've worked with. They're saving money, and the market premiums are even better, and I'll give you examples. And we could talk about affordability, if you'd like, because that's competing with what I've just said. So as a scientist, I've had the honor and pleasure of working all over the world studying the healthiest ecosystems on the planet. And not enough time to take you through that this evening. I'll tell you that I've learned four things. And by the way, this is an 1828 watercolor painting hanging in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C of right where I live in southern Wisconsin. And not enough time to take you through the details, but the landscape was a vast expanse of diverse wetlands and prairies and savannas, very different than where I'm at now. And I know that. I'm giving you another example to give you a sense of how what you've experienced here and are, will be experiencing is not much different than what's occurring uh, in many places elsewhere on the planet. So what we've learned studying the healthiest ecosystems, whether it be the, the Yukon and the, the Arctic, uh, tundra regions of, 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 of the Northwest Territories, or none of it, or the Yukon, uh, or the prairies and savannas uh, where I live, is that the, the healthiest example or rep representative remaining examples of healthiest ecosystems on the planet all exhibit diverse, dynamic, productive, and stingy 
uh, capacities. Diversity is expressed at all scales, from the different plant and animal species, the genetic diversity present, so different, different phenotypes uh, representing different genotypes, uh, different plant communities, plant associations. The dynamicism is expressed at all levels. Uh, when there's an unusual drought period, a period of unusual drought, uh, drought adapted species come right out of the plant and animal communities and do just fine. In urban Chicago during a drought like you had this year, it was 4,000 acres of lawn that died. The last drought they had in Chicago, nothing came up. Uh, they had to replant, they chose to replant the lawns. That's not dynamic, that's a system that's you know, entirely uh, supported by our activities. Productive, I always, I, I go to the little restaurant in our farming community right now when the farmers are harvesting corn and soybeans and they, they call my wife and I the weed farmers because we've planted our 80 acre farm to prairie and wetland and savanna and orchards and gardens. And whenever they say, ha ha ha, you don't grow anything but weeds, I say, well, we actually grow a lot of life and you could measure yours in the number of bushels of corn, but we can measure ours in the tons of life per acre, and I guarantee there's a lot more life uh, on our land than there is on your land, and they always, ha, 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 but you can't sell it at the market. Stinginess is one of those factors that, um, when we, we started studying ecosystems and how, started studying the hydrology of ecosystems back in the 70s, my mentor and professor was Dr. Luna Leopold, Eldo Leopold's son, and I asked him a dumb question. I was reading journals of settlers moving across the, the Midwestern prairies, and they never mentioned rivers in the 1800s, and late 1700s. They called them morasses and swamps and anything but rivers. And now on a road map where they said there was a morass, whatever that was, now there's rivers. It turns out that the healthiest ecosystems hold on to water and hold on to nutrients. And I'll give you some examples how we've taken advantage of that principle. So ecosystem restoration, in my simplest definition, is about rebuilding the stinginess of landscapes. So landscapes hang on to water and hang on to nutrients. And that is done by creating diverse, dynamic, and productive systems. Uh-oh, I don't know what happened. But, uh, but this slide is so very important because this is where I live, but it's more important to you because this is where most of your beer and bratwurst and cheese comes from if you're a connoisseur of those things. Uh, magnificent contour agriculture, big investments in, in contour farming and other uh, agricultural conservation practices. But as beautiful as this landscape is, it's lost its stingy, stinginess and it's lost most of its diverse, dynamic, and productive capacity. The, the productivity is shunted through corn and soybeans. It's lost most of its topsoil. Uh, and of course, flying into O'Hare Airport, this is a, a landscape where if a dog takes a leak on the parking lot, the detention pond goes up five feet. That's a joke. Um, it, everything that falls on the property, on the land is exported as a waste product whether it be dog turds or bubble gum. These are systems that do not honor the value of important resources. Maybe a bubble gum wrapper or a dog turd isn't a good example. Maybe you're not getting it, but the stinginess is gone from this system. I, I don't know what in the heck. We're gonna be playing ping pong here. <laughs> um, everything we do on the uplands affects the lowland environment, whether it be a pond that I grew up near in northern Illinois, which has six to 10 feet of sediment, and you can see the invasive aquatic plant, European milfoil, uh, Myriophyllum spicatum, uh, very expensive to even begin to hit the undo button, to dredge, to remove sediment, and so forth. Uh, what most people don't recognize are, are the ecological changes that are occurring right in front of our eyes. This is the exact same place photographed with a, a five-year time lapse. Image on the left, 150 to 200 native vascular plant species in a wetland type called the sedge meadow. 
Uh, that's the exact same site after a development went in with ineffective erosion sedimentation control. Two to four feet of sediment washed in over a period of about five years. We went in with D7s and D8 Caterpillars bulldozers, you know, and we removed the substrate down to what we could identify as the historic wetland substrate surface. And because ecosystems have seed banks, they have turians, bulbs, seed spores, rhizomes, uh, alive and viable for some period of time in the soil system, by reestablishing the soil surface elevation, removing the sediment, we were able to stimulate the seed bank, and about 95% of the species you see on the left there have come back from the seed bank. So, there is a whole range of, of issues that we're running into in urban areas. Image on the left is separated from the image on the right by a two track dirt road, a farm road. And on the far side of the image on the left is a railroad track. Uh, for 150 years, the railroad has spawned wildfires, fires that have sparks that have been set by the railroad moving over the rail. And that fire has spread from left to right and it stopped at that farm road. And healthiest example of a tall grass savanna, an oak savanna that we have in the Midwest is what you see on the left. In fact, while most people won't really care about it, uh, we discovered a new species of spider not known to science. Most people would say, got rid of that one. But this was about an inch long wolf spider, beautiful big spider that we only know it from that site. It's never been pre previously or since identified elsewhere. Um, on the right is what happens where invasive shrubs, in this case European buckthorn, Rhamnus catharticus comes in. It forms a dense understory beneath the big majestic bur oak trees, which are 195 to about 275 year old trees, beautiful big trees. And in the dense shade beneath the buckthorn, we're measuring 30 to 50 tons of soil loss per acre per year. And with that goes the insurance policy, the seed bank. The seed bank that if we remove the buckthorn in, in a variety of ways would come back and help us restore that system. Uh-oh. Uh, this is a publication from the, from the 80s that we, or early 90s that we did, that showed the healthiest examples on the far left. I had about 300 vascular plant species, native plant species, wildflowers, sedges, and grasses, and about 28 breeding bird species in about a 30-acre site. When the, sh when the invasive shrubs came in in the 1970s, I think there might be a pointer here, hot dog, um, we started having the, the number of breeding bird species down to about 15 and the vascular plant species was cut by about, down to about a sixth. And what's happening now is the acorns from the big, big oaks you know, are falling into the dense shade and the acorns don't have adequate quantity or quanti quality of light. They're beginning, they're imbibing and they're beginning uh, to germinate and then they die because of inadequate quality and quantity of light. So what's left is this invasive shrub layer and uh, the breeding bird species remaining include European buckthorn, uh, I'm sorry, European starling, which has the ability to detoxify an alkaloid in European buckthorn. It co-evolved with the European buckthorn plant in uh, Europe. Uh, quite in contrast to what Smokey the Bear tries teaching us in the US, we've been burning these savannas, these forests, and completely re rejuvenating, revitalizing all the stormwater management functions. These are infiltration driven systems. They typically, historically, other than under frozen conditions, we have something called ice and snow where I come from, other than under uh, those conditions, these systems did not discharge stormwater. They infiltrated even rare event storms and we've got evidence of that we can share with you. So here's one of, the, one of the important things that began to teach me about landscape hydrology. Uh, when I was talking to Luna Leopold in the 70s about rivers and saying we didn't have rivers historically and now we have these deeply entrenched and laterally dynamic and unstable systems. Uh, he said go find data you young inspiring ecologist and bring me data. I, otherwise this is nonsense. 
So it turned out in, the, in, in 1904 in the US Supreme Court, there was a series of uh, litigated projects, and this is one of them near Chicago, where a power company put a dam across a watershed, a river called the Des Plaines River, illustrated in yellow. This is uh, 628 square miles, about 400,000 acres of land in yellow. The predecessor of a real friendly sounding agency, uh, the, the Army Corps of Engineers, the predecessor was called the Department of War, sued that power company and said your dam is illegal because it's uh, blocking a navigable waterway. And there's about a 22 year daily in certified engineering record of the amount of water, the discharge from this particular watershed. And I summarize that and I'm just gonna dance even lighter here. This is a duration flow curve that tells you what percentage of the time from that watershed the discharge was at or above a given level of discharge. And I'm just gonna, if you walk down to the river in the year of 1899, 50% of the time if you went down to the river, about four cubic feet per second were coming out of, the, out of this 428,000 acre watershed. You guys are probably metric, and I won't convert it to cubic meters for you here, sorry. But um, four cubic feet per second is around 32 gallons a second. At, at that time, the landscape in 1899 was vast prairies and wetlands and savannas and forest remnants. And then in the early 1900s, just a few years later really, uh, agricultural activities came in. Uh, German farmers, my relatives, came in and started installing underground tile systems to drain the wet lands. And they started ditching the, the, the streams. And this is actually uh, 1900, each of the blue dots, this is going to be a, 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 an eye test here. Hopefully you see there's blue dots. Uh, each of the blue dots is a farmhouse that was present as of that year. Hopefully you've noticed that there's more blue dots in the 1950s. <laughs> if not, your blood sugar's low. Um, and by 1999, if the eye test is really working, you'll, you, you see there's a lot more blue dots. And at that time, large areas of the, wa of the watershed were urbanized and suburbanized. And at that time, if you went to the same duration flow curve and looked at the, the median, the 50 percentile and red cross, uh, around 780 cubic feet per second is coming out of that water, was coming out of that watershed. So from a, a, a mean, a median of around four cubic feet per second to about 780 cubic feet per second. And what I've eliminated from this is all the groundwater, the permitted groundwater pumping that's taking groundwater life from a, line, a quarry and dewatering the quarry and dumping it into the river. So this is just meant to understand the land use change, uh, runoff changes, if that makes sense to you guys. The river used to be at grade, now it's in some places 20 to 30 feet below grade. So that's some of the science that I wanted to share with you. These changes have occurred everywhere on the planet that's been urbanized and everywhere on the planet that's been subjected to agricultural activities and large landscapes that have been set, subjected to forestry practices. So what we're looking at here is universal change, not just something that happened where I live in Wisconsin or Illinois. So I'm gonna give you a series of examples now. Township scale, which is 36 square miles. Metropolitan scale projects, which are about two to four million acres in size. And then uh, talk about how these examples relate to parks. So the first thing we've done on large projects and small projects is establish the ecological underpinnings. We do a natural resource inventory uh, and nowadays we're able to map down to about a, 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 a centimeter on the ground, multispectral, hyperspectral, pixel size, and we're mapping individual plant species at that scale with that resolution over large acreages and doing it relatively inexpensively. The next thing we do on projects uh, is establish the, an overlay of parks, trails, and greenways. And lastly, we begin overlaying the built environment. Where should development go? Where should it not go? And if there's development that's occurring, how might that be retrofitted to accommodate uh, stormwater and a number of other uh, benefits that we're trying to achieve? 
So here's an example. This is just a couple square miles. Um, hopefully you can see there's yellow polygons with little alphanumeric codes in each. This is an example where we said everything within these uh, green, blue, red, yellow buffers are important natural resources that need to be protected. And one way to start a conversation with the community was to say, let's put up to 200 foot buffers around the outside of all of these important natural areas. Now that doesn't solve any problem if you've got something like, a, like an agricultural ditch running perpendicular to the buffer and bringing uh, agricultural runoff right into an important natural area like a wetland or a lake. We then started looking at how to incorporate trails within those buffers. That's what the red lines show. And we started the, the idea of let's establish parks within that landscape. And that's what the green systems are that you see here. I'm trying to get this to advance. Uh, this community was worrying about its future because of the 3,000 acres of natural lakes in their community and the deteriorating water quality in those lakes from agricultural and land development. And uh, sorry about the color, baby poop brown, I guess. I don't know what you'd call that. But uh, what we proposed was that this whole area that you see in whatever that color is really had to be protected. And their master plan for their city, for their township, really had to offer a series of solutions so for example, if development was going to occur in these areas, they really had to take and only use infiltration, no overland runoff from the developments at all, all the way up to the 100 year design storm event. And it completely changes the way one thinks uh, uh, and, and, and designs uh, when you have to have a completely maintained infiltrative driven system rather than a you know, detention ponds and, and storm sewers and so forth. Here's another example. This is a, a city uh, embedded in Madison, Wisconsin, which is a pretty hip place, um, where the city had uh, a major flooding problem. And the proposal that was designed by the design engineers was to put a 90 inch diameter pipe that took water from the flooded area directly into a beloved lake called Lake Mendota. And nobody wanted that. The other reason nobody wanted it because it went right through uh, First Nation Indian mounds and a whole series of other heritage and cultural areas. And we were brought in, we designed these stormwater management principles which were focused on using ecology rather than the engineering solutions what the heck? We, we designed a, a, a way to look at frequent events, rare events, look at storage, and look at water quality, uh, and uh, really prevent the problem, the deterioration of Lake Mendota. We started the process, so this was an example where everybody said the only solution was a 90 inch diameter, you know, $15 million pipe, and they didn't have any way to value the First Nation uh, artifacts, uh, the archaeology, it, was, it wasn't even part of the conversation. We said, if you look at the watershed that's tributary, there's all sorts of public land in that area. There's public right-of-ways in, in boulevard medians, there's church properties, there's school grounds. Let's take a look at what each of those properties might offer in terms of addressing the flood damage reduction needs and we started putting together conceptual plans, us ecologists, and then the engineers on our team said, let's convert this into a model and, and eliminate, deduct what we can store and deduct the, the, you know, the volume reduction, deduct the, 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 the release rates, and look at the benefits. And I'm not going to take much time and take you through this, but it turned out this was a buried stream, a wonderful stream that was in a, a, a 10 foot wide by five foot high box culvert underground. And we said, let's bring it back to the surface and celebrate this wonderful stream. The conclusions basically was that we had more than enough public space without impacting the function of the public space 
to use that public space, it would cost about twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars per acre foot. But with smaller dispersed systems across this landscape, we could solve the problems that they were having with flooding. Um, here's a project. I'm 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 Jewish, and I don't want to pretend to understand Catholicism, but I want to give you an example of a project. So here was a church that had been in place for years and years and years, over 100 years, and they decided to build a new cathedral, but because the church was never uh, properly designed for stormwater management controls, the whole new, the new church, the cathedral, and the old church now had to, in order for them to put the development in, they had to put stormwater controls in for everything. And the design engineer proposed a 12 foot deep detention pond. The drop off point to go to the new cathedral was right there and it was a, a catwalk. And the parishioners were so nervous when they saw this, it'd be like me standing next to a 12 foot hole walking to the church. It cost an additional $2 million to build that and fortify the foundation of the church. And we said, how many gutter downspouts do you have? And looked at the, the existing building and the proposed building. And I think there were 10, is it 10 stations of the cross? Anybody Catholic here? 12, 12 thank you. 12 gutter downspouts. We said, let's build 12, 12 rain gardens, associate one with each, which, with each downspout. We saved uh, like about 90% of the $2 million. And the church parishioners made each of these a station of the cross and built these wonderful gardens. And we solved their stormwater problem for a couple hundred thousand dollars and got everything through retrofitted and got the permitting done. Just a different way of thinking. Uh, wonderful little rain gardens with little stations of the cross where people sit and luxuriate in their spirituality and enjoy the flowers and the butterflies. Uh, here's a project that may be very applicable to the discussion that we're having here. Uh, the question, this is from Milwaukee, a three million acre uh, urban landscape. How can every dollar spent on green infrastructure also be an investment in new parks and open space? How can green infrastructure design, designers, engineers, park designers and ecologists work together to create a solution rather than everybody working in their own disciplines? How can ecological design save significant costs on the infrastructure, saving capex, opex, and operations and maintenance uh, money? And how can this result in an increased park investment? So here's the, the green infrastructure originally was called Green Fingers, and it was a way to rebuild a landscape of small scale to medium scale to large scale restoration projects that solved a major flooding problem in Milwaukee. Uh, here's an example of, the, of Milwaukee downtown is here. This is about 35 miles north. And here's the watersheds. What we found was 28,000 acres of historic wetlands that are now drained, tile and ditch drained and used for agriculture. And we said, why don't we take uh, about 6,000 acres of those and restore those as wetland? And it turned out that cost about $150 million to buy the land or buy the easements. And when we modeled it, we were solving about 90% of the flood damage reduction needs in the downtown metropolitan area. All the rivers come right through the downtown area. Uh, Milwaukee spent $2.5 billion and solved about 43% of the flood damage reduction needs uh, with a deep tunnel system, which hasn't been working. They keep having raw manure, raw human manure spills into Lake Michigan, and there's hundreds of millions of dollars worth of lawsuits resulting from these raw discharges, CSO discharges. So now Milwaukee has floated the bond money, and they're, I think they're up to 2,000 acres of the 6,000 that they've purchased and they're beginning of the restoration process. So instead of $90,000 per acre foot, it's costing about $12,000 an acre foot. And instead of investing 150, 200, 300 feet below ground in some high maintenance tunnel, 
uh, they're investing in land and restoring land, which also becomes parkland at about one-tenth the cost. They're removing their daylighting streams, removing concrete channels uh, that they were, were put in the 1930s through the 50s and creating these wonderful open spaces that are available now for people. Using stormwater treatment trains, all sorts of the, whoa, that's wild. All sorts of the businesses are, and, and schools are using this at different scales. So instead of high maintenance lawns, this is the new South Milwaukee School. US EPA give, gave this an award for alternative stormwater management deployment. Uh, all of the, the, the parking lot, many parking lots in the area and other developments are doing the same. Uh, there are some really high density environments where below parking lot storage is being put in place. One of the interesting things we've been learning about is how do you take these high maintenance parks? Parks in Milwaukee are mowed lawns, a lot of them. And there's a lot of them if you've ever been to Summerfest in Milwaukee. Uh, they're spending about $12,000 per acre per year mowing lawns 22 times and aerating lawns. Uh, what we've learned is that we can convert those, and I'll show you this in a second, uh, to native grassland, wildflower, savanna, forest, wetland systems, and the maintenance cost is about $50 to $100 per year, per acre. We're taking areas where the mowers continuously damage trees. You know, they bang into trees and the trees don't live too long. They don't appreciate getting banged into, apparently. We're converting those to native vegetation. We're taking obvious challenging places that shouldn't be mowed in the first place and converting them. We're taking areas that were large landscapes of lawn and making them very deliberate and restoring those to native vegetation. So it turns out if you do a break-even analysis at even a, at the, at a low cost for restoration or an average cost, the break-even is about a three-year period. If you don't need any additional capital if you're managing and maintaining your park property and mowing it, you know, the way they do 12 times a year, 20 times a year, uh, you can use the O&M money, the operation maintenance money, to transition about 10% of the park or more every year into native vegetation. And then after about year three, the maintenance costs go way down. And we've cash flowed with break-evens of three years or break-evens with more elaborate restorations at about eight years. And this is allowing some park districts to transition large acreages very quickly with no additional capital needs which is what this says, if I can advance it. So here's something I want to share with you for Kansas City. This is a three million acre area, seven counties if I recall. This is natural resource or natural area mapping, natural area mapping down to one meter square on the ground for three million acres. This is a summary of all the lakes, rivers, streams, wetlands, floodplain, floodways on that three million acre area. Here's all the high quality upland ecosystems, barrens, uh, uh, savannas, different prairie ecosystem types, glades, and other ecosystem types. Here's the two of those put together. And the red dots were known important endangered and threatened species locations. Here's all the parks and open space. It turned out only 6% of the most important natural resources in the whole metro area were captured by the parks and the greenway systems. So 94% of what was important in the natural systems wasn't captured. So we decided how could we begin to expand the metro green and the park system? Uh, how could we contemplate a future where we picked up a larger percentage of the most important valuable resources? And we made, uh-oh, you can change. We made one policy change that's been adopted in all seven counties. We said 100 foot top of bank out into the adjacent landscape. We want to protect those, dra every drainage way, even, even buried drainage ways. So drainage, historic drainage ways that are underground. We want, to, we want to honor the memory of those locations and all existing drainage ways, 200 foot 
basically a 200 foot buffer uh, centered over the stream, centered over the, the ravines. Every county has unanimously passed this as policy. One policy change immediately protected 91,000 acres of land in Kansas City. The other important thing that this did is it gave the city and every county uh, access across private property to maintain these stream systems and restore the landscape, the savannas and other vegetation along these stream systems. Here's a project uh, that was a HUD project, Housing Urban Development Agency in our country. They forgot to take geotechnical coring borings when they designed the development in the 60s. They only went down 15 feet and there was a buried landfill from about 15 to 30 feet down. And after about 20 years of after constructing this, everything started falling apart. So we said, um, let's bring the stream that was down 32 feet back to the surface. And that was physically impossible and economically impossible. But we created the memory of that stream at the surface. This became the central organizing feature for redeveloping. That's the new development called Heritage Park. And we created uh, so the new stream is all the stormwater coming in from adjacent lateral stormwater systems and it's the new stormwater landing on the several hundred acres of property. And it's a wonderful little stream that flows in the Mississippi River and it's, it's, it's central organizing feature for reinvestment of this development. It's worked real well. Well here's uh, a couple projects that you're probably familiar with. This is the Don River project in Toronto. We're part of the design team where the first ever redevelopment or redesign of a new river mouth on a large body of water, in this case, uh, Lake Ontario, was designed. This hasn't been constructed yet, but this is a remarkable project. I think the mayor is now gone, the nasty mayor. Well, you guys might think differently about that mayor. Uh, I think he's now gone. He, he put a stay on this project, but it looks like the project's uh, slowly moving forward to develop the Donlands with this large central organizing river mouth and a large park. Here's what the river looks like. Uh, an awful lot of analysis went into that, including historic analysis to understand what the river used to be like. And then we did reference area analysis of local rivers, began to articulate the different water sources, polluted uh, runoff from an, uh, uh, you know contaminated urban areas, clean rooftop water, clean water from other sources and began appropriating those in the new, new design to create the wetlands that folks wanted along the Don. Uh, we used uh, what I saw today, silva cells, which I had never heard of before this project, and created a half-life for the trees and the streetscape that was probably longer than five years, maybe, maybe 10 times more than that. We began looking at the improvements in, uh, in the wildlife and the and this is historic, a representation of what used to be on the land. This is present condition. And these were the improvements we expected with the dark green symbols. Uh, for every group of wildlife, we did a, 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 a separate plan, the mammal plan, the frog plan. It was really an interesting process. So let me race through. This is a project that some folks have heard about. It's a 700-acre project north of Chicago called Prey Crossing, where we basically threw out all the best management practices, all the stormwater management controls required by policy and regulation in the US and in Illinois and in Lake County, Illinois. And we said, let's design the stormwater management system around using ecology, restored ecological systems. And the first thing we recognized is uh, all the engineered systems are produce predictably unpredictable hydrographs. And that's not good if you're an ecologist or if you're a frog or a fish interested in predictable hydrographs. This is nature's hydrograph, predictable seasonal high and a trajectory toward a seasonal low. And on the left is what we find coming out of darn near every engineered system. Small lots, in this case, 4,000 to 10,000 square foot lots, organized around, and that's, that's the olive green, organized around large open space systems. Uh, here's a view. Deep rooted native plants that really, really have increased the infiltration. 
Some people have used uh, formal native landscaping. Others have said, screw it, I'm never going to mow my lawn again. And they've planted their whole yard to wildflowers. So what we did on this project, just by changing the design thinking, is we reduced the 100-year peak by 100-year flood peak by over 70 percent, and we saved uh, about 30 percent on the cost. No storm sewers, no curbs and gutters, no detention ponds, and wonderful nature and uh, trails and agriculture. And here's another project. Uh, this is an 8,000-acre project with the Nature Conservancy. Um, and I'll just go through it quick. This is a square mile, the black inset. I just don't know how to make square slides. It's not supposed to be rectangular like that. This is, these are the legal ditches that, and, and encumbrances. Uh, this is a, the square mile on the center pivot irrigation trace you can see. There's the tile system under that square mile. We did seed bank analysis, put a restoration plan together, phased the plan, began the construction, uh, seeded it with about 340 native species, locally collected uh, species that we hired. We hired school kids to work with us for a three-year period to collect from the local remnants, prairies, wetlands, savannas. We used a Jesus Christ machine, which is what I call it, it walks on water, literally, and we seeded every 48 seconds, we seeded one acre with this piece of equipment. And then we basically plugged the ditches and the water immediately came back up. And within a period of months, we had magnificent plant communities. It's now been about eight years and we've got 2,000 acres restored. We're well on our way to 8,000 acres. I think with that, uh, oh, it's been a remarkable uh, asset for the community and also for a very rare bird that we're reintroducing and that was the reason for this project. That's Whoopi the Whooping Crane at the International Crane Foundation. I think with that I'll shut up. There's all sorts of other projects. You know, mining projects where we've used the same ecological design before and after. This is the only mine on the planet that's been backfilled, completely backfilled. Magnificent response, and with that, I'll, I'm sorry, I went a minute or so over. <laughs> um, I'll start with one question for Steve. You've worked at a lot of cities um, and in, in different projects and visit a lot more. Where, where are the models that you can point to for urban areas like Vancouver that can learn from the experience of others? I, I think there's puzzle pieces that can be found in most cities. Maybe this is what you wanted to use. I think, I think there's puzzle pieces that can be found in most cities, example projects that are working at a particular scale. Um, I think the innovation around water management that I'm seeing that's ecologically based is probably coming out of the Chicago region in this country. Uh, we're, we're, we're forced in some cities now to take it seriously, uh, ecological design that is. So we're working in Houston right now. We were about to release a report that showed that purchasing and protecting 50,000 acres of the Katy Prairie north and west of Houston would have compensated for the reservoir failures that, are, that did occur. We'll be going public with that in a few weeks. So there's, the city is about, that city is about to have a rude awakening that they've invested in some of the wrong strategies and it hasn't provided the protection they counted on and the modeling that was done in support of the economic decisions that were made was flawed. So I, I, think, I think other than places that have Chicago's flat, heavy glacial clay, glacial till soils, some of the clay soils like you have here, but you have a little more slope than Chicago does, uh, everything floods in Chicago, so they've had to learn about alternative stormwater management and started you know, back in the 70s and 80s. Any questions? I'll take the microphone. Hi, Dan. Hi there. Hi, Nick. Uh, Stephen, great presentation. You've worked all over the place, as Nick just said. Uh, one of the new approaches that uh, we're seeing is municipalities 
starting to value or take account for their natural assets as they are already uh, as one way to kind of counteract this development. I'm wondering if you could speak to that phenomenon kind of North America wide or even abroad and what the effectiveness of that is. Everybody understand the question. You're asking, I think, about ecosystem services and the importance of uh, accounting for those assets. Is that, that's what you're asking, Dan? Yeah, and even in, in yeah. within like the, the budgets of, of their yeah. municipalities. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I think, I think it's real important. We take for granted uh, the values uh, of the land. We might appreciate beauty. We might appreciate, you know, big, beautiful trees, but not many people take it down to the level of understanding, you know, the, the, the soil organic carbon on the landscape and the fact that every acre, uh, if there's a 1% increase in organic carbon, it'll hold about 12,000 to 60,000 gallons of additional water in the soil, not in a depression on the soil, but in the soil. Nobody thinks that way. Uh, scientists are just learning about that. We're part of a team measuring that now. Uh, people don't even think about the interception. You know, what does a, a, a tree canopy uh, do to diffuse the impact of rainfall? Uh, where I come from, where we have prairie systems, a one-inch rainfall can be completely intercepted by prairie grass with no measurable increase in soil moisture. Interception is real. It's not in any engineering models. It's never accounted for. So I think, I think what's happening now is that there's this wonderful awareness uh, trying to find its way onto, onto balance sheets. Uh, ecosystem services, you know, the, the sequestration rates of plants and the value of photosynthesis for improving uh, soil carbon. That's not on any balance sheet, to my knowledge, on the planet right now. I guarantee in probably two or three years it'll be on balance sheets because we're realizing that organic carbon, remember that stinginess thing I talked about? It's the organic carbon and soil colloids, like clay colloids, that are really what supports that stinginess. So I think ecosystem services are really, really, a, it's a valuable way to think and it's a valuable way for for uh, people with an accounting mindset, whether it be a policymaker or a city council member, it's a really valuable concept. It's incredibly valuable to understand what you're losing or what you've lost and to figure out how to reinvest in bringing some of those values or assets back is, is just critical. First step in thinking about how to reassemble the pieces, if that makes sense. I'll just add from my experience in Vancouver, one of the challenges around ecosystem services is the land values that we're dealing with. So if a single family lot is worth 1.5 to $5 million, depending on what part of the city you're in, the tree cover, the soil volumes, the kind of carbon storage and things like that is going to be a challenge to use against those kind of land values. So we're kind of, we basically boxed ourselves in to, to, to use that argument in a sort of an accounting uh, basis. I mean, we don't, I think it's a supporting piece for sure, it just seems like we can't rely on it in Vancouver. But, but a counter to that is when you look at the, eco, at the landscape scale impacts of the changes that are occurring and then you amortize that over the individual lots, if, if there's a billion dollars of damage from a storm event, uh, from a flood event, um, there's no way communities can sustain that sort of impact regularly, regardless of what your values are on your lots. You know, the insurance premiums and the pricing completely changes. So I'd say the systems thinking approach changes the way one does the accounting and does the allocation of, of how you apply the ecosystem services to landscapes and to lots. Still all very early in kind of developmental uh, thinking stages. So a lot of room for uh, people to think and, and contribute to this thinking. Another question, sure. Um, forgive me, I don't understand stadiums. Could you maybe use a Vancouver example? I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't understand it. How about if I use a universal example? Two little kids fighting over a toy. Uh, that's how the 
idea or the word came to me. I was watching two of my cousins fighting over a toy and the, the, the mother said, oh, he, that, that child never shares anything. Every toy, hope this makes sense, every toy that the other child gets for a minute, it's pulled right back by the first kid. Maybe that doesn't relate at all, but it, it, the word stinginess is, it, to me, really helped me with, with defining the term for purposes of hydrology. All, all it basically means with regard to ecosystems is that the plant and animal communities, the soil microbes, the life on the land really is, is not freely uh, releasing nutrients and water. It's hanging on to it. And it's the whole, the whole evolutionary design of these plant and animal communities above ground and below ground is to hang on to these materials. So three years after the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980, we studied the Toodle River and studied the, you know, what had come off of the, the watershed and the, the pre-eruption uh, discharge levels in the Toodle River were back to what they were uh, three years after the eruption. So the other thing about ecosystems is they, the, the resilience of ecosystems is, is focused on an evolutionary, uh, evolutionary behavior and response to become stingy, to really regain whatever it is, you know, the diversity, the productivity uh, that creates that resilience. I hope that helps. And the child example may have confused. Thanks. A question over here. Um, what we'd really like in Vancouver is for our development to decrease and for some of our high rises, instead of being high rises, to become parks. <laughs> We'd love that. It doesn't look like that's happening. So um, you did mention for permeability. So we're, we're looking for permeability, right, of soil. Presumably old growth forest, probably the most permeable. Um, and a paved area is the least permeable. So the water will just run right into the local rivers. So you mentioned a parking lot being um, a porous kind of material. So what should we be telling our developers to increase permeability and water retention? I would say that I would encourage them to think holistically about the whole site and what their plan is gonna be for the whole site as a system as opposed to just throwing out kind of specific tools. So we know that in our urban area, we're not gonna have no hardscape. So there's gonna be hardscape. So what makes the most sense? Do we wanna have that water flowing off of that hardscape, cleaned, and then using that water for some other purpose, like actually capturing it and using it for some other part of our system? Do we want it infiltrating locally? I know that that's a huge opportunity, but I would say rather than sort of giving a prescriptive solution, what my hope would be is that people would think holistically about the whole site, the whole system, and how they're designing nature to be integrated into their way of doing the development. You know, we're thinking about things like green roofs. You know, we know that we're gonna have larger floor plates. Do we need to have conventional roofs? Can we have more green roofs? Do we wanna look at rainwater harvest and reuse to help offset potable water? Maybe we want actually some blue roof systems. So again, it's more of a systems thinking about what the goal is. One of the things that's been really interesting about the work we're doing around the uh, Rain City strategy is starting to identify on a watershed basis for Vancouver, what are the different priorities in different areas? If you know that your development is in an area where we have a very significant green deficiency, where we have huge challenges potentially with urban heat, and we know that having uh, water available locally would be a high priority from a long-term water security perspective, the kinds of strategies and design tools that you would want to take in those areas would be different than an area that maybe doesn't have an urban heat problem, maybe has a, actually a great wealth of ecological uh, systems in place and so other solutions might be more appropriate so I hope that when we get through this process what we can start to think about and communicate is what might different priorities look like in different communities from a watershed perspective and then of course for a local community different local communities are going to have their own um, needs and interests and so how do we reflect that as well so I would just say not a prescriptive solution but more a performance base and show us your creativity of how you can try to meet the interests that we're describing. 
I'll also add that, I mean, in many cases, infiltration obviously is the primary focus of trying to uh, increase permeability. But in parks, for example, sometimes we're looking at water capture and reuse. So we're needing water for irrigation or we're needing water for a wetland or to sustain urban trees that aren't doing very well in these drought situations. So how could you use a hard surface, either a roof or a parking lot, to capture some of that water and reuse? You obviously have to have a place to store it, but that's part of the equation as well. It sort of blends the kind of green infrastructure with, with uh, some of the water conservation as well as the ecological values we're trying to sustain. Can I add to that? I want to add one more thing. Um, there's a really great video. You can check it out on YouTube. It's called The Berlin Sponge City. And we love that one. We just came across it about a month ago and it really captured what we're trying to do. But anyway, the, the urban hydrologist in the, the video says, you know, how do you find ways for even soil to hold that water so that it can then actually evaporate into the atmosphere? And he called it nature's air conditioning. And he talked about the, the community of Rummelsburg in Berlin that 20 years ago actually designed a community with no sewer system, no drainage system, right? And the idea was actually providing soil volumes and areas where water can infiltrate, it can be held, can naturally evaporate, into the atmosphere that it's not, you know, infiltration is one important, but actually evaporation or evapotranspiration through our plant systems is another really important mechanism. Part of that, again, that natural water cycle we're trying to restore. So just, you know, put that thought out there as well. Slight hold over here. I think what we've learned is that the best way to communicate is to have principles and to incentivize innovation around those principles and backstep the principles with perform measurable performance criteria. And um, I think I'm learning, I think I've learned today that you don't have quite the regulatory leverage or hammer the way we do in the US with the Clean Water Act and you know criteria that uh, developers have to, some simple criteria uh, that can be used to back, to, to back into the principles and to innovate. Uh, it's far too easily done for the design community to, you know, think that there's five ways to do something and then they simply size those five ideas for every project when, in fact, there's an infinite number of ways to do things. And when you apply the principles instead of, you know, five formulas, when you apply the principles to a piece of property, you come up, if people are being humble, honest, open, and really applying principles, you come up with wonderful innovation that usually is far better than any formulaic approach and can get us in the US to equal or exceed the you know the regulatory hammers or drivers. Thanks. We were given notice that we're about halfway through about <coughs> a minute or two or three ago. Hello Steve um, this question is directed mainly for yourself. Um, we do have regulation here, particularly in terms of pollution of our streams and waters, as in the United States. But get, getting back to the main themes, it would be fair to say, perhaps, that most of the people in the audience are disciples of what you're saying already. Our problem really here in Vancouver, which may exist elsewhere, is that we have a lot of silo-type regulation and silo departments. So whereas the park board may be concerned about their budget for, say, tennis courts or replacing the green turf for playing soccer, um, the, the Rose Department may be concerned about, well, let's have uh, ornamental trees in the boulevards instead of shade trees because they do a lot of damage to the sidewalks and the roads and so all those kind of things. Even our planning, our area planning, our community plans, and I've participated in the last three, do not mention the watersheds. Watersheds is like, outside this room, ask 100 people, you may get five that could say, I understand what a watershed is, and if you look at the map that was presented this evening, all of our uh, political areas bear no resemblance whatsoever to the watersheds. So, Getting more to the point now, um, it would seem to me that we need to raise the issue of water, water quality in particular, the integration of the ecosystems, and 
bring back the ecological services they provide, we can't put a, va a value on them precisely at this point, to a point where politicians understand the need for the critical nature of preserving the ecological services and so on. How do we do that? So I thought that perhaps um, one way would be to make sure that it starts with the young kids in the schools. Unfortunately, our parks boards and our school boards and our engineering departments, perhaps, and I stand corrected on this, they don't get together and discuss how the kids can bring this or nurtured through this process so that it becomes a critical item when they're of voting age. Our political system is such that I mentioned the word housing, affordability, and traffic. They're the three items. Watershed, never. So is there anywhere in the United States where this has been brought to grassroots level through the scores and up and onwards? I, I think there's wonderful examples. Um, even in Canada, we worked on the High Park uh, restoration in Toronto, and I was, I was uh, in initially amused at the way uh, school groups came out and were fascinated by the restoration of the savannas. And then I began to realize the importance of that conversation to the community. Um, it came to fruition because there was an inspired mayor, Mayor David Crombie, uh, and a planning, head of planning, uh, Ken Greenberg and others. Um, I think in the US, I think we've got wonderful examples where school children are brought in to add an exclamation point to something that's de-emphasized or not linked, not coupled with the real issues. And I think there's great examples of that, uh, but they're not necessarily operating at scale. You know, so the flooding in Houston, I, I, there's no uh, poster child or there's no conversation yet. I think what's going to have to happen and is about to happen is the economic alternatives are being looked at uh, and the, the mythology about the, you know, the fallacies of, of past designing, past thinking is gonna be elevated to consciousness. There's a lot of people suffering, a lot of people that lost everything. So the conversation is gonna change, is changing very quickly. I think every day there's editorials in the newspaper. I think it'd be great if they're written by children that simplified everything but that's not happening to my knowledge. Um, I actually think there's bottom up, top down, uh, meet somewhere in the middle and their middle's moving uh, ways that have to be brought to bear to make this conversation really effective. Um, we tried doing it with a little bit of science that goes over a lot of people's heads. Uh, what works best in my experience is kicking the tires, taking people out to solutions that have worked and letting people in a, in a group uh, hear about how, why the solutions have worked, taking people to places where, the, where failed solutions uh, haven't worked and letting people understand why they haven't worked. This is about a kind of a reality check that has to do a 360, a full circle around the issue. And you know, children are part of that conversation. I mean, I think there are exceptions to that generalization that schools are not sort of involved in some of these things. Go out to Jericho Park and most weekdays you'll see them using it as a cross country race course, which is great, but there's preschools that are using it for outdoor education and things like that. So we're, we have a, the park board now has an environmental stewardship coordinator that's trying to partner schools with parks. Uh, Oak Meadows Park near Van Dusen, it partners where they're Camber, for example, and they do a lot of pollinator mingling work. So these still might be exceptions, but I think that's changing. And part of it has been um, limited by the resources available to schools. I mean, I think we've looked at school grounds as almost as much green space across the city as, as parks, in, in, at least in some neighborhoods, but they haven't had an opportunity to plant trees or diversify some of it. They're just mowed from corner to corner to corner because of the lack of those resources. So I think, you know, I'm not saying we can change that or that's an easy thing to change, but I think we, we acknowledge that there is opportunity, opportunity there at least. Question over here. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, like we've been talking about uh, watersheds and making things more accessible for the public. Um, like with, like 
Vancouver is developing very, very fast right now. And so and it's very it's a very complicated process a lot of the time. And so people are always looking for sh shorthands to uh, manage that. So like you know, like so one of the things that s stuck out to me was uh, the importance of elevation within the watershed. Would that be an effective tool for people just to have an entry point to the discussion, or would there or would there be another one you would suggest? Quite sure I understand what you mean by elevation. Maybe you could just expand on that. So di distance from the tributaries. So I if you're just in the trickle zone or stream zone, river, okay, so uh, coastal. Okay, with Vancouver, as you saw from the map, we don't actually have a lot of natural streams anymore. We've only got a few, really, that are at the surface. So most of our streams are buried. But what I will tell you from our drainage sheds, which is our man-made sort of modern incarnation of what used to be a stream system, is it really matters what happens in different parts of the watershed. So the more upstream in the watershed that you can actually take water out of that system and allow it to infiltrate or, or evaporate or evapotranspirate, the better it, the effect is gonna be on kilometers and kilometers of pipe network down the road or down in the system. So absolutely targeting upfront in the watershed matters. Like I bet most people don't realize that when you flush a toilet on a really rainy day at 39th and Canby, you are likely contributing to a combined sewer overflow in False Creek. Most people probably don't make that connection because they're not thinking about that system's perspective and they're not thinking about how everything's connected. So 100%, we need to take action everywhere. We need to take action at a small scale throughout the city that collectively will have a big impact. But I definitely think there's great potential to be strategic about targeting certain parts of our our uh, watershed areas in a priority way to try to have a greater um, benefit and impact downstream the whole way. So we've got time for two more questions. We're, we're I'm interested in um, the band play concept and the planning of the park and your experience in the commercialization of parks um, for parks and recreation and competing priorities, trying to build budgets, and, and have you had experience about that and competing competing uh, parties and priorities? Um, let, let me think about that. Okay. It, it's more the focus on commercialization because that's a real threat. I'm, I'm not actually even with the park board, so I don't know that I can speak to commercialization. The only thing I will say is I think with the creativity we have in Vancouver, there is a tremendous opportunity to try to leverage multiple benefits for a single investment. And I think from a culture change standpoint, that's something that we really aspire to, is to think differently about how we can make one intervention, one investment, one approach that actually can have many different benefits for many different interests as opposed to the way that we might have done it in the past where it's more single purpose oriented. So that helps mitigate some of this competition for resources and access to uh, resources to deliver on our needs. I, I do have something to say, but it's a, it's a, it's a different way of thinking about commercialization. Um, what would the incentive look like that encouraged everybody with a private yard uh, that manages raindrops that fall upon the earth to um, do something on their property and to benefit financially from what they offer uh, in some sort of measurable way you know, if you're if you're measuring or if you're uh, managing every raindrop, giving every raindrop a soft landing, coddling every raindrop with love and showing it into the ground, y you've committed something on your land to be able to do that, and you'd think that would be valuable if everybody did that, uh, and the scale of everybody was large enough. You know, the, the operation and maintenance costs and the replacement costs for all the infrastructure that the city, that all you are going to pay for with your tax money, um, should be greatly reduced. 
So I would, I would think there'd be a, an incentive and a commercial value in figuring out how to incentivize that sort of behavior. And I don't think that's exactly what you were asking about, but hopefully that's helpful. Your turn. No, I'm going to go on to the last question rather than go on that. One more question. Um, so I think uh, one of the issues, especially in a city like Vancouver, we don't have a lot of large new like, natural areas that we'd be able to reinstitute, especially given the land values and that, but I think there's a lot of smaller scale interventions that can happen throughout the city. And I think one of the real challenges that I've seen where these often fail is we're great at building them, but really bad at maintaining them. And do you have any good examples of um, cities that have maybe had a really, um, are, are a good model for stewardship of these spaces and maintenance? So the best uh, examples I've seen are the Leopoldian motivated examples where you know, you, you really uh, make uh, these projects participatory and engage and empower the community in a variety of ways. And you know, most, most agency budgets aren't good at doing o &M. They're good at protecting, buying land, doing the, they're good sometimes. Depends upon what the budget's like and what the costs are. But uh, we, we, the best examples of O&M I've seen are where we add a real estate transaction surcharge to the, every transaction a piece of property goes through. And what we've done in the states on probably uh, 40 or 50 projects, maybe 100 by now, is we've added one half of 1% of the original transaction value and all subsequent transactions on the property in perpetuity to create an environmental endowment. And that endowment is being used to finance the operation and maintenance and stewardship and public education and funding scholarships and watersheds. So I think, I think creativity around funding, and I'm not talking about a developer impact fee, which, which is paid once and usually paid to reimburse sewer costs and other you know, utility costs. I'm talking about something on top of the real estate transaction value that's transacted that kicks into an environmental endowment account that's privately managed, not publicly managed. So it's managed to generate a return and you know, 80% of that return or 50% of that return is reinvested annually and the interest off that money is used to finance stewardship. So assurance around funding and a program, once the, the funding is in place, we've generally seen good people are hired and programs have continuity and have coherency. And that, that and participatory conservation are the best projects. I'll just share an example of uh, Prince George County in the US that they did what's called a community-based, I guess it would be a community-based P3 so public-private partnership, but rather than having sort of a for-profit for model, the model was actually about community stewardship, community empowerment. So they actually developed very extensive green infrastructure um, installation programs covering you know, hundreds of acres. And the idea was that they did it on a 30-year contract with community organizations. And the way they were able to rationalize it to their city council to support it was not about um, good stewardship of the watershed and all this. It was actually all about economic development for communities that would benefit from increased um, capacity building, education, support in learning how to run and operate a small business. They looked at, um, I think they had different targets around um, different sort of minor minority groups and different groups that they perceived to need additional support getting into the economic uh, workplace. They had you know, training programs about how do you manage uh, small employees? How do you do your books? How do you develop business? So it was a huge economic development program. And what's very interesting is actually that model is delivering very affordable green infrastructure investments. And so the people are responsible for not only doing the capital investment, but actually doing the O&M on those investments over 30 years. I'll tell you that in Vancouver, and I see one of our my colleagues from city of Vancouver who's really actively involved in thinking about operations and maintenance, we're keenly aware of this issue. And we're really trying to 
foster a change in mindset about the role of plants and ecosystems and the health of those soil ecosystems as a fundamental part of how we manage water in the city. And it's not something where we could just say, well, we're just gonna neglect it and um, you know, let the boulevards go hairy. Maybe we should let the boulevards go hairy because they're enhancing our, our uh, interception of rain and, and whatnot, but we're just trying to really sort of articulate a different way of thinking about our urban fabric and that these natural assets in our city play a fundamental role to the quality of our city and in fact the performance. And so we need to care for them as though they're performing that wonderful service for our community. Thanks very much, that's a great way to end. Um, so I'd like to thank both our speakers, Melina and Steve. It has been a great evening. So please. Thanks.